<laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Cowell, the university librarian. Thank you so much for coming. This is our second human book event where we invite alums to come and talk to you about their career path. And we're really focusing on STEM fields um, because we're in the science and engineering library. And um, one of the things that we had planned for this building, you might or might not know that we have a console collection. So old games you can check out from the circulation desk and then play in kind of a dismal room. I don't know if it was here when you were here. <laughs> so our goal is to raise money for that room to really turn it into something better for, for the students. The games get used quite a bit, um, but I think the whole experience really could be improved. So we, the library really supports the computational media and games programs on the campus and really want to continue to be engaged. So I want to thank our speakers, Brendan Seaman, who is a distinguished engineer at MZ, Simar Ball, who is entrepreneur and co-founder of BitPollen, Aum Soft and Laughing Ear, and Danny Zuniga, who is Senior Project Manager of Analytics at MZ. Thank you so much for being here today. And we have lots of time for question and answers, so please engage. Mic check, mic check. Thank you guys for coming, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you to Yope, sitting over there, uh, for inviting us to talk today. Thank you. Um, so, do a quick, uh, quick introduction for each of us. Go ahead, Summer. Um, so I was a physics major. My name is Summer Ball. I was a physics major. I went to uh, Merrill College, um, and my focus uh, was studying physics. And okay, Keep going. I think, yeah, I was studying physics, uh, and um, but that's not what life had in store for me. So uh, eventually, I got into games and. These days, a mainly app developer and entrepreneur. Uh, my name is Brendan Seaman. Uh, I was a uh, class of 2006. I went to uh, Crown College and um, majored in ISM, Information Systems Management, uh, with a focus on computer science, and uh, currently a software engineer in the games industry. I'm Danny Zaniga. My graduation year was 2003. My college affiliation was Merrill. Um, I am a data product manager and work on automation for games. So a little bit more about us specifically. We'll give you a quick background about where we come from, what our life was like, uh, how our life was at UCSC, and uh, what we're doing now, uh, and how that experience has gone. Um, so I grew up in the Bay Area. I was born in San Jose. Um, I lived there for actually until I came to UCSC. Uh, I went to public school most of my life. I went to a private high school. Uh, my dad was a police officer, and for the longest time, that's what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, I, I really was uh, trying to follow in his footsteps, and I wanted to go out and catch the bad guys and, and be a part of the police. Uh, that changed drastically as I got older. Um, but uh, as I was young, he was really into computers, uh, so I got exposed to computers very early on. And eventually that led me into a path to learning programming, learning how to assemble computers and about computer hardware. And so that really became a passion of mine as I grew older and through high school. Um, and you know, as I was transitioning, getting ready to go to college, uh, I chose UCSC uh, because I had a strong CS program, although I didn't really know that computer science was what I wanted to do for sure. I knew I wanted to do something in tech, so that was kind of certain, but as far as what that was, Honestly, I had no idea. It could be IT, it could be programming, uh, you know, really up in the air. So I didn't decide on a major right away. I kind of chose the safe route, and I think at the time, ISM was described to me in a way that made it sound like you have a lot of different options. So you could do hardware, you could do software, you could go into IT. Uh, so that's, that's what I registered as. And as time went on, uh, I started realizing more and more that I really loved software engineering. And um, as I'll get into a little bit later, I wasn't a very good student and didn't go to class, um, which I do not condone doing. Please, please go to class. Uh, I would show up for finals and midterms and try to pass the class. It was, it was bad. Um, but I spent the time that I should have been going to class programming in my spare time and researching and learning about computer science. So I was developing my skill set, just not in the traditional way that you would if you, you know, take a standard CS program in a college. 
Uh, eventually, uh, I kind of got my act together and realized that I, I'm going to need to graduate at some point. I uh, ended up taking five years, so I, I, I started in 2001, graduated 2006. Um, and uh, by that time, you know, g given that I'd been doing all this programming in my spare time, writing applications, trying to you know, get my foot in the door with games, uh, although that would come a little bit later, uh, I realized at that time, you know, programming is my passion. That's what I want to do as a career. And so after I graduated, I um, started at a, game, a company called Santa Cruz Games, which was one of the only game developers in Santa Cruz at the time. And that's where I met Danny and Simmer, uh, who had been working there for a year or two uh, before. And that was, that was my foot in the door to the game industry. And I kind of got, got my feet wet and learned what the working environment was like there, was like there uh, how to deal with crunch time, uh, just basically all the dynamics of software engineering that you don't learn in school uh, and all the soft skills you need to, to be successful. Um, and then following that, I was there for about two years. Um, uh, I, and I was living in Santa Cruz at the time. I ended up moving back over the hill uh, to the peninsula. And at one point was unemployed. And someone I knew previously from Santa Cruz Games as well uh, was at, a I think, uh, I think GDC or some conference like that. And he met the founder of a startup called Machine Zone. Um, and he was looking for engineers. And so I, long story short, I ended up being the first employee uh, of Machine Zone because my friend flagged this guy down after his talk and said, I know a guy uh, who needs a job. Uh, we interviewed at a Starbucks, and the rest is history. So I've been at Machine Zone now for almost 10 years. Um, joining that company is probably the best decision I've ever made in my life. Uh, I've worked my way up at, from a uh, you know, junior engineer all the way to technical director. And now my official title is Distinguished Engineer. And I honestly didn't know what that meant when I got it. Uh, it's kind of a weird thing to say. Uh, but basically, the, the best way I can describe it is like a, a professor getting tenure. Uh, you've just been at the company so long that you, you know, you've reached the top of the tier, and they don't know what else to call you, so they just give you a, an extra title on top of that. Uh, so that Oh, so yeah, when I started, it was the three founders and myself, and we're currently at about 1,200, I think, 1,200 employees. Um, so I don't know if you guys know Machine Zone. Uh, we make Game of War and Mobile Strike and Final Fantasy for iOS and Android. Uh, you may have seen the commercials on TV or gotten Facebook ads uh, that say, play Final Fantasy now or play Game of War. Uh, but yeah, those are the three main titles we make, and we we made a lot of games before that that a lot of people don't know about. But yeah, as successful as it was, it was those three titles that we're, we're really known for. Uh, so yeah, that's that's where I'm at now. So once again, I'm Danny. Um, so I was born and raised in San Diego, California. Uh, I had a very hardworking father. My parents were separated, but I was very close to both of them. Uh, one of the things I remember my dad would always tell me was, you know, you, he would tell me, you, gotta, you have to go to college, you have to learn, but just because you go to college doesn't mean you're going to be successful in life, and he always drove that point home. Um, you know, as I was growing up, I wanted to be a mathematician, an inventor, a scientist. I knew it had to do with something with creating and uh, science and math. Um, but really, the turning point came one day when I was sitting in my room, my uh, friend's dorm, playing Tony Hawk, and you know we're sitting there eating taquitos, playing Tony Hawk. I think we're listening to DJ Sh Shadow, and he says, "I have a friend who works at a company in LA, and he does testing for games." And I was like, "Wait, what?" And he was like, yeah, he, he tests games for a living. I was like, wait, you can make money making games? I was like, this blew my mind. Like, here I was studying like math and economics, and I had no idea that there was this industry devoted to games. So I knew at that moment that I wanted to be in games. I just didn't know how, you know? So I, I kept on route with math and economics. Um, at some point in 2002, I took um, electronic music here. That was like Brendan said, the best decision I've ever made in my life. Um, and, you know, my experience here at UCSC is that I really felt like I grew up here. I became who I am. Um, you know, I left San Diego. I left, you know, sunny San Diego and found this place where, you know, it was okay to be a hippie. It was okay to care about, you know, eating healthy. It was okay to care about the environment. So it was like so many things that I had within me that was just fostered at this place. Um, but 
I really wanted to graduate. You know, I didn't want to go into graduate school. I thought I could do more. I thought I could do better for the world. I loved learning. I loved going to class. There was just something about the system that didn't agree with me. So I was like, I am going to go graduate. Like, no grad school for me. And I realized that I was completely wrong. I had so much more to learn. You learn a lot outside of school, and you learn a lot inside of school. But I didn't know how much I didn't know until I actually left school. Um, and you know, for the next uh, six years, me and Simmer were actually doing a lot of uh, different things. We were entrepreneurs. I started a t-shirt company. We were doing audio. But all those things really drove me and got me to where I was. And, um, you know, there's a cliche that says do it while you're young. This is extremely important. Life will catch up with you. You know, for me, it was a moment in 2012 when my mother got sick and I realized <laughs> I need to make money. I have somebody else to take care of. So I you know, started applying to places. And luckily, one of my best friends worked at Machine Zone, and they needed a BI analyst. And so I joined Machine Zone. And you know, that was a complete blessing in dis disguise, because those, these last five years have been amazing. And I've grown a lot and gotten a lot out of just being at that place. Right, Simmer. Uh, and I'm Simmer. Uh, Ball. I was born in India. My dad was a banker at that point, uh, but eventually after he moved to the U.S., he uh, went into computers. Uh, my mother uh, was a stay-at-home, but my, my grandmother actually is who pretty much raised me. Uh, she taught me to read very early on, uh, and just not even just stories. She was just very into kind of learning about uh, life in, uh, in general, the big questions kind of she would ask me as a kid, um, part of that stemmed from the fact that she was a, 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 like a, a women's minister in Punjab, nor, northern India, helping uh, rural, rural women uh, with kind of, you know, just who had no resources. Um, so early on, I got just a love for just books, just reading tons. And then uh, both my parents were musical, and uh, they actually met and had a love marriage in the time where there was only arranged marriages in the mid-70s. Um, because uh, they were they were musical, and so we always had instruments around the house. So I played instruments uh, from a very early age, um, and then, uh, uh, but but still had no really any clue what I was going to do uh, down the line. I mean, I just had uh, tons of jobs, I, uh, and uh, it just nothing seemed to kind of uh, gel until towards sort of the <coughs> excuse me the the end of high school. Um, when I realized this might be the last chance that, like, going to college might be the last chance that I really have to learn something in a deep way, and uh, and all this stuff, these big kind of questions that I had, they kind of uh, coalesced into uh, uh, you know studying uh, physics. Just I was just amazed that all this stuff is going on uh, around us all the time. There's these black holes that exist. There is there's you know the birth of the universe. How does this? Uh, and we, we you know we just kind of go about our daily lives. So. Uh, uh, that was that was uh, 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 it was it was pretty much uh, uh, the sort of this push that this might be the last time that I get a chance to study. Although now there's uh, as as great as resources are here, there's so many uh, online courses and everything. So you just you, know, you can keep going forever. As, as as but at that time, it certainly felt like it might be the last um, uh, the chance to do this. And I audited a bunch of classes. I. I went to Danny's classes, I went to my brother's classes, I just just uh, tried to get as much of the experience as I possibly could. And um, actually one of the nice things about Danny was my hallmate also at that point, and that's how we initially met. And uh, he actually, uh, I, you know, sometimes it's good just to find uh, somebody who's uh, just moving along and just hit your, uh, hit your wagon. So he was, uh, uh, I, w I was never sort of, uh, you know, after graduation, I, uh, HP had come by our physics department. They they offered us really nice salaries, and um, uh, I thought, you know, that that sounds interesting. They 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 had a nice pitch for what to do there, but uh, at the same time, you know, like Danny mentioned, we started this sort of very small clothing business, and it just seemed more interesting. I never thought I'd be an entrepreneur in any sense of that word, and I I just I just knew that there was jobs that you you know you go to, and then hopefully you can do some fun stuff in your own time, and, uh, and this was uh, uh, and. You know, having to do everything from scratch from that business just kind of set us down this path. And you know, as uh, Danny mentioned, he got it hired for Santa Cruz Games, and uh, we'd been writing uh, music 
together for many years, and so as they needed to grow, I, I was brought into that that team as well, and uh, and uh, uh, pretty much from there we just moved, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily linearly at all uh, in the as far as even games go. You know, we were doing music and composition in those days early on for almost what, five, six years, seven years, and then uh, but as time went on, uh, we kind of you know moved on to. Uh, to to uh, uh, to San Francisco, it was just because to be in the middle of everything, and then uh, at that point, uh, um, you know, it was just uh, the recession hit in uh, 2007 eight, and so you know, and that also uh, kind of brought the the job prospects, especially for sort of the artistic parts of the games industry, down uh, to very few, and so at that point, partly we had you know some friends. We're kind of uh, out of work, and so we got a, you know everybody just together and uh, just created our first uh, iPhone app. This is like right when the App Store opened, and then just got the bug for kind of developing apps and uh, and um, and games and everything uh, on our own. And uh, and then as Danny mentioned, even there we didn't kind of stop there. Uh, eventually, we ended up having our own uh, a much bigger company down the line, uh, or slightly bigger, I guess I should say. Uh, and uh, with the uh, with that, which was you know focused on analytics, so we'd gone from kind of music to um, to uh, product management to uh, to analytics, which had nothing to do. But again, both of us had uh, technical backgrounds, but mathematical, uh, and so it was kind of. But it seems natural now looking back at it. So that's my story. All right. So now you know a little bit about us, and we want to know a little bit about you guys. So we're going to do a quick poll. Um, how many of you guys are graduating this year? All right. And then let's get a sense of where you guys are at major-wise. Arts majors? Yeah, somewhat, somewhat. Uh, science majors? All right. Back there, what do you guys? Just shout it out. Yeah, all librarians. Okay, it's a good major. Um, how many of you guys are certain about what you want to do for your career? Uncertain. Okay, that's pretty pretty common. It's pretty normal. Uh, is anyone really apprehensive about post college life and, and what's going to happen? Okay, well, uh, hopefully we can leave some of those concerns for you guys. Um, so we were kind of the same way. I think none of us really knew what we were gonna do as a career. We might have had a general idea, but no you know, dead set, I'm gonna do this. So we wanna talk to you guys about choosing a career and what we feel is important uh, in that decision. And uh, I guess first off, uh, in, in, from my perspective, I think for me, the most important thing was choosing a career that you're passionate about. That's something that you want to do is fulfilling, um, something that rewards you day to day. Um, because if you think about it, if you're you know standard 40 hour work week and you're working 40 some odd years, uh, that's gonna be almost a quarter of your waking life spent working. And if you're doing something that is not fulfilling, is boring, uh, you know, you're going to be miserable after a while, and you, you don't want that. It's such a huge part of your life. Uh, it can affect, you know, stress at work can affect outside of work. It can affect relationships, uh, and so if you're if you're going to choose a career, I think you, know, you shouldn't you shouldn't go with something you know for you know monetary reasons. Uh, some of you may have you know, parents that you know, are trying to push you into one career or another, uh, you know, which I understand, and people have different situations, but uh, I really urge you guys to to think about you know what's going to be rewarding for you, and uh, from my personal experience, I come into work now every day and I want to be there and I look forward to going, and I know a lot of people don't have that same uh, feeling and they dread going to work and they they dread the weekdays after a weekend, and for me it's like the weekends and weekdays are just a blur. It's it's the same thing because. Work is such an integral part of my life, and I enjoy doing it. Um, that it's it's not just somewhere I go to make money. Uh, and you know, I think it, it's it's very important to try and find that if you can. 
And not everyone's gonna be able to do it, and I understand if you have a different situation, but uh, to the extent possible, uh, I just urge you guys to, to seek that out. Um, and yeah, I think that was my main point. All right. I think passion is super important. I mean, I, I work with a lot of people. I've worked with a lot of people at Machine Zone. I've worked with a lot of people. And I can literally look at someone and tell whether they're passionate about their work or not passionate about their work. I know who I want to work with because they're passionate about their work. Um, passion, it's what, passion is what is going to set you apart in work. So um, one of the things I want to talk, to talk about is that it's actually not a very straight line to figure out what you want to do. It's not a very straight line to get to where, at least for me, to get to where I was. You know, it's okay to not know what you want to do right after you graduate. Uh, you might discover what you want to do through certain experiences, through jobs, through meeting people. So if you take me, for example, when I landed here in, at um, UCSC, I knew I liked math, you know, but I wanted to try to explore something, so I, you know, declared linguistics, and within one quarter, I undeclared linguistics, you know? So I went straight for math at that point. I was like, yeah, I like math. I'm, I knew I was good at math, but I was like, I would say good for my high school. What I discovered here is that, yeah, I wasn't that great at math. I was a, you know, B at best, C student at math, but I loved it so much, I was willing to work really hard at it, you know. Um, I took a couple of economics classes as an elective and found that I was actually really good at economics and it was actually kind of interesting. So I uh, started a double major and you know, in 2002, again, another pivotal moment in my life, um, my roommate comes home and he, I forgot what the paper is called here, but maybe City on the Hill. Uh, yeah, he brings City on the Hill and puts it down on the coffee table. And I just see the headline says, UCSC builds $3 million recording studio, electronic music program, like upgrade or something. And I read through this thing and I'm like, wow, this is super cool. Like, I love music. Like me and Simmer had been writing music. We play music, we record music. I'm sitting in like, you know, these programs trying to edit music, like this is what I do on my free time, right? So I f apply for that, for that program, and I remember the day that they, that they posted who got in, I like open it, and I, me and uh, Simmer's brother were really good friends, and you know, I open it up and the monitor shows it, and I'm like reading down the names, and my name's not on there. And then he, my friend Ricky, grabs the mouse and scrolls down, and my name's the one name that wasn't like on the monitor because my name starts with the Z. So, you know, I got into the electronic music program, and that was amazing. You know, so I was like, okay, I'm doing the electronic music minor, and like, you know, I'm five years into UCSC, and my account, my financial aid counselor just says, hey we don't give financial aid for the sixth year here. So <laughs> you're gonna have to like figure something out. And so I was like, well, I'm really close to economics and I've just took electronic music for fun. So I'm not gonna finish electronic music and I'm not gonna finish math. I only have two more classes. One of them is, I forgot, it was called seminar, which is you're basically just studying something and putting it out there. And so, you know, lo and behold, you would think, okay, I'm gonna go be some kind of economics math guy. But my first job out of college was actually because of my electronic music degree. It was because of that moment in 2002. You know, I knew I wanted to work in games. I spammed every game company in California. I knew I wanted to stay in California. And I said, I can do math, I can do electronic music, and I can do economics. I wanna work in games. This is what I wanna do. And luckily that day, the audio engineer and sound designer from Santa Cruz Games quit. And so I was in an interview a week later and working at Santa Cruz Games as an intern by March and had a full-time job in June. So like that was kind of like one of those really lucky moments that I got there. But you know, you would think, okay, now I'm gonna be a sound designer, composer for games, or maybe sound designer, composer for games, movies, entertainment, right? So me and Simmer start doing this. We go off on our own, go to San Francisco. Um, again, the recession hit, so we're like, okay, we need to grab 
all these people, we want to make a game. We know a bunch of people that just got laid off. Let's make an iPhone game. You know, me and Simmer had been working with external people, so we knew how to do production. We knew how to do project management. So we got a game together. We, we built an iPhone game. This is really early. The game was really fun if you could get through the first 10 minutes and learn it, but it wasn't fun if you couldn't. So we learned a lot about designing games with that game. Um, but you know, we kept going down those two paths. And one day while doing an audio contract for one of the very first Facebook companies, Facebook game companies called Crowdstar, um, our friend had been working there as one of the very first engineers. You know, we're waiting to talk to the CEO and uh, head designer. And he's like, Danny Simmer, come here, check this out. And like, he's like writing SQL queries on his computer. And he's like, I can see how many people are logging in today. I can see how many people are buying this item. I can see, right? And he's like showing me all this data they have on the games. And like at that moment, it clicked. I was like, I can be a game designer. Finally, like math, like I can use math to be a game designer. Oh my God, like, just screw music. Like, I loved music, but I really, really, really loved math. So I was like super excited. So, you know, we started, we started trying to work in that. And at, the po at that point, there was no analyst for the games, com for games industry. You know, they had it in web. So what did I do? I became a product manager or a producer and just used my skills and data to help, right? And then... Like I said, in 2012, I needed to find a job, so I contacted Brendan, you know, and he got me in front of their CEO, and me and Simmer went and interviewed. We worked there for about three months. Simmer decided he was still wanted to be an entrepreneur. I decided I still needed a job. I still needed to make sure I could, you know, take care of my mother, so I stayed there, which again, to me, was a great decision. It, you know, I got a lot to do a lot at Machine Zone, but even there, I started as an analyst, and then I was a data product product manager, and now I'm a product manager for automation. I have designers working for me. I have live operations working for me. I have pr project managers working for me. So if you look at that that trajectory, how would you know that I would end up where I am right now? Like, it, it really is never a straight line, and like Simra was pointing out, it's really hard to see in front of you, and it's really easy to see behind you, and you can see how it all connects after the fact, but, you know, it's, it's never going to be a straight line, and there's going to be ups and downs, and the downs are definitely opportunities that you have to take and grow with. Okay, next. So now the fun part, after you choose your career, is getting a job in that career. And it's an interesting process. It can be long, it can be frustrating, you can get discouraged very easily. Uh, so I want to give you a little bit of advice on what to look out for, what to expect. Um, who's, who's working now? Anybody working now? Is it in the field that you want to be in eventually? All right. It's experience. As Danny will, will say in a bit, um, even kind of lateral experience helps. Just odd jobs that you can put on your resume. Some have skills to transfer. You never know. But uh, when, you do, when you guys do graduate, you're going to enter the job market. You're going to start your job search. Uh, and so we're going to give you a few tips on what to look for and our experiences uh, in that process. All right, so um, applying for jobs and getting a job is what actually we call in the industry a funnel. Uh, you have a lot of people at the top and very few people at the bottom, and there are actually numbers behind this. So for every thousand resumes that um, a recruiter will read, only about 100 of those thousand will get in front of the hiring manager. So the hiring manager then reviews the resumes, makes some phone calls, and whoever he or she likes, they bring in for an on-site interview. At that point, you really only have 10 people that reach an on-site interview. And from those 10 people, three will get offers. Maybe one to three will accept the offer. So you're looking at one in 330 from resume to job offer. Now, um, this is not meant to like dissuade you, but you have to find ways to short circuit, short circuit this funnel, right? And you can do it many different ways. Um, the most important and most critical one is uh, networking, getting referrals, making friends. Obviously, I'm at Machine Zone because of Brendan. Um, I hired someone that I met playing Magic one day. I 
I, I referred another UCSC grad that happened to be like an amazing person at merchandising and uh, technical stuff. So he helped us build like amazing merchandising systems. So knowing people is very, very important. Um, one of the ways you can short circuit this. Another way you can short circuit this is um, LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is again really important. It's what I, it's really what is the new resume. You should really think about being your own SEO. Um, also using social media, but really it's about trying to get people to find you and skip certain parts of trying to find a job. So the more you do, the further up you get before you even drop your resume in anybody's hand. Okay. Uh, yeah, lo location matters. Uh, uh, I mean, but for for the most part, again, things have kind of changed now. Uh, you know, a lot of people do telecommute, but I think early on you'll have to um, find that place that's that 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 is uh, that you can work with and that they're willing to let you work, you know, somewhere else if uh, if that's what you want to do. Um, you know, like there is a. Uh, in, Traditionally, it was like if you wanted to be a model, then you'd go to New York or Paris. People are found there. If you wanted to be a Hollywood actor, you go to uh, you know L.A. The, there's no other place like that, and that's part of the, the similar along the same lines. That's why Danny and I eventually had to move to San Francisco. I think as much as I love Santa Cruz, there's just not, the jobs just weren't here. So that that's really what. And the, uh, as soon as we moved there, certainly things opened up quite a lot because there's just uh, I don't know if Danny's already mentioned this, but there's something going on pretty much every night and you can find people who, who are doing maybe something you want to do or at least at the company that you want to do, you can just pick their brains. Um, uh, this is, I uh, had a little anecdote when I was actually, so uh, location when I said that, I meant it kind of in a general sense uh, as a city or something like that, but when I was uh, an undergrad, I was finishing up my thesis, uh, which we had to do an undergrad physics thesis, uh, and uh, uh, I, I was helping my advisor, who was, uh, um, who just didn't like messing with uh, any sort of electronic devices, and I and I built all kinds of electronics since I was a kid, so I was pretty comfortable with it. Um, and I happened to be talking with uh, the, the the ladies at the physics uh, head office, and um, they just they were like, "Hey, are you looking for a job?" And I was like, uh, "Yeah, sure." And so I just got a TA ship like that. Like so, it's just. I mean, part of it's also just being, you know, in these little crowds. Again, it makes a difference, not just the city, but sort of finding these niches. Uh, we went to a lot of uh, uh, early on. I think it was the uh, meetups. Like yeah. there's, yeah, just different kind of things. Anything. Yeah, so um, I, I don't know if it's still around, but it used to be meetups.com. <laughs> I think now you can Google search events near There's me, but you can find ways. a mixer, a talk like this in the peninsula every day. There's free food. There's professionals. People are willing to talk to you. I highly recommend that part of it. Um, something every day in the peninsula, all the way up until San Francisco. Yeah, and that's part of uh, the next piece of advice, which is to start early. So if you're going to graduate this year or even before that, um, depending on your timeline, uh, I would suggest starting to research. Just go out, meet people, look at the companies that you're interested in or that you think you might be interested in and understand the differences between, say, a large corporation and a startup company. Uh, get a sense of what it's like to work in each. Uh, I would suggest uh, definitely looking at stuff like Glassdoor. Uh, they have reviews of businesses, so you can go through and see what the employees rate the business out of five stars, and they can leave feedback. And it usually, usually gives you a general sense of what it's like to work there and what you can expect. Um, consider doing internships. So look around for some place that you can gain experience. Uh, it gets you directly into the company, and you know exactly what it's like to work there because you're there firsthand. And if you don't like it, then now you know what it's like. You can look for something different. Um, and just just try to get your name out there. Try to get known. So uh, Danny and Simmer are going to talk more about uh, making connections later on. And that's probably going to be the most important thing uh, that you can do for finding a job. Um, but you, know, you, you need to hoist yourself up above everybody else in the pool. And you're going to come out of school, and there's going to be tons of other people applying for the same positions. And you're going to have a similar set of experience, which is typically just your degree. And 
you want to stand out somehow. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that more in a second. Um, but just, just have something ready and understand you know, what you want to do and uh, where you think you feel comfortable working. Um, and then on another side of that is uh, having some sort of portfolio. If you, if you, if you do something in the arts, uh, if you're an engineer, if you're a designer, have a set of work that you can show off to people. And that's, that ends up actually being way more important than having a resume. Uh, I know from experience in hiring that if I get a resume in and there's a portfolio alongside of it, I'm 10 times more likely to be interested in the person that has the portfolio because I can see exactly what they've done. It's tangible. Um, yeah, I can play around with it. Uh, it's visual. And so it just gives me a much better sense of what that person is capable of versus trying to read through a resume and using my imagination. Uh, so uh, I, would, I would again urge you, if you have free time, uh, if you're an engineer, go onto GitHub and do some open source projects, uh, write a game engine, uh, just do something that exercises your skill set and can show people and prove to people, hey, this is what I'm capable of. Uh, you know, I have this degree, but also here's this entire other body of work that I can show off. And you're already you know, miles ahead of everybody else coming out of school at the same time. Um, so I actually have a personal story about this you know, for Santa Cruz games. When I went to apply, it was actually before I graduated. And I, I knew that this company existed. I knew what games they had made, but I really felt that you know, to, to make myself stand out, I needed to get in contact with somebody that worked there directly. And so I researched uh, who their producer was, uh, our old producer, Alex Noisy, who's I think previously at LucasArts and, and other larger companies, but he's a pretty well-known guy in the game industry. So I reached out to him, just kind of cold email, and said, hey, uh, here's my portfolio, here's what I've done. I'm really interested in making games, and you know, I, I like what you guys have done. I think I could contribute. Uh, can I come in and meet with you guys sometime? And I kind of had to pester him a little bit. It took you know, maybe a couple months of back and forth emails, like he was busy. Uh, but I, I didn't give up, and I, I could have just kind of given up when he didn't respond for a week or two. I mean, like, oh, bummer, like, he, they're not interested. But uh, I kept at it, and eventually he said, okay, okay, like, I have some free time. Why don't you come meet me for lunch? Uh, so we met up. I met some of the other people that work there, and I just kind of made connections with people, and that got me my first interview there. And so that was kind of the key was, you know, being persistent and continuing to reach out um, and not just letting it slip away. Like, it, you don't want to apply somewhere and not follow up. Uh, so uh, I guess the, in, in summary, just you know, be as prepared as possible and don't find yourself kind of at the end of school, graduated and lost and not knowing what to do. And just try and do your research and have a good idea of what's out there and what your options are. All right, so standing out as you know, Brendan was pointing out, you really have to try to get a leg up on everybody else that's sending resumes. It's, it's super important. There's many different ways you can do this. But one of the ways that is also super important is to build up your experience, even if you're doing unrelated jobs. It's, it's still all super important. Um, many skills transfer. Uh, you'll be surprised at how many skills transfer. It's just really about doing stuff and improving yourself and learning from the situations that you're in and having more to show, right? You know, uh, throughout school, in, at school, I learned Photoshop, right? And then I also learned Flash. And then I learned HTML because I wanted to start a t-shirt company. I used all those things in my next jobs, you know? Um, sometimes you, you wouldn't even think so, but like I was worked as a, um, TA at the Children's Center down here, down at the base of campus, and I even learned from that. I learned how to, the importance of being direct and clear with people. You know, I learned about speaking in positives, making sure you're not telling people what you don't want them to do, but telling them what you want them to do. All these things are things that I use in my job, and in the end, also help in the interviews and help when I'm trying to convince people and rally people behind what I'm trying to do. Um, yeah, Sim. Yeah, um, uh, and also there's, you should definitely, you know, tailor the resume, each resume that you make for that company. Uh, you know, just a generic resume is like a, like a, just a weak handshake. Um, you really want to go in there um, showing them that you understand what they do. Uh, I mean, again, if it's games that you've played them, 
uh, you know, you know who kind of their maybe main competitors are in the for the different uh, type of games that they make, uh, their products, uh, you know, their 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 team. Uh, maybe there's someone that again you could possibly uh, there's a UCSC grad there that you can go talk to. Yeah. So uh, it's always good to just do as much you know research as possible. Again, you should time box it so you're not spending weeks and weeks on one company. Yeah. One point on that is that, you know, it's not always necessarily about making the company feel like you care about them. It's also about having people talking to people who are extremely busy. You know, I've read hundreds of resumes and had to call hundreds of people. And I'm literally going from meeting to meeting, reading documents, talking to engineers and OK, it's resume time. And if I have to make the the, if I, there's a disconnect between the resume and what I'm doing, I have to like, you know, change my, my, my way of thinking to read the resume, and you've already lost me. But if it's about what I'm doing, if it's about the company, it's such an easier connect. That cover letter is important because it connects you to the company. So that's just one point that I, it's really important. Just think about that. Think about this person doesn't have any time. How do I connect to that person as quickly as possible and show them that I care? Um, so a good example of this um, is I applied to Namco uh, for a job many many years ago, and I was about to get a phone interview. And I, you know, I'd played you know, dozens of Namco games in my childhood, and I thought I had a pretty decent grasp of the games they make. Uh, I didn't bother to go back and review what those were, um, and then found myself on the spot on the phone interview, and the guy's like, "Well, so are you familiar with our games?" And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, okay, can you name like five Namco games? And I couldn't do it. I just blanked out. Um, so I, I should have at least done the bare minimum and just you know looked over their portfolio a little bit and reminded myself what their games were because it, I came across as I don't care, like I'm not interested. I'm just you know I'm just shooting out my resume and trying to get a job somewhere. And they don't want to hear that. They want to know that you're interested in in talking to them and interested in working at the company because they want someone that's passionate about working there. So just a, an example of where that uh, can go wrong for you if you're not, not aware of uh, what company you're talking to. Yeah, and uh, again, I, we've mentioned this a few times now, and I think we'll talk about it also a bit more later, but mixers, events, um, you know, there's, for games especially, there's a lot of companies that'll be at PAX. So you can meet, you know, PAX or GTC or any of the conferences that happen uh, and just, uh, going and talking with these people, uh, just so that, you know, you make yourself available to them. That's uh, it's the best thing you can do. One of the best things you can do for yourself. Yeah, and I already talked about having something to show off, so we'll skip that. But uh, uh, in order to get there, uh, if you want to build a portfolio, uh, if you're looking for resources for that, there's lots of free software out there you can make use of. So if you're into games, you can use Unity or Unreal. I think there's you know, Unity is definitely free. Uh, Unreal, I believe they have. Like, if you make under a certain amount of money, it's free. Uh, and then there's also many different versions of student software out there. So a lot of the creative software, um, I think, has free student versions. And I'm sure there's a program at UCSC still where you can get that stuff. Uh, even uh, IDEs for programming. Um, you know, pretty much anything uh, that you would use uh, in professional work has some sort of student version. So I would seek that out and try to find that and make use of it if possible. Yeah, you don't have to torrent it like we had to. I think we got free versions when we were here. All right, so you made it to the interview. So I've seen all kinds of interviews. I've seen people who are completely nervous. I've seen the exact opposite of people who are super duper confident. and. Um, the big thing about that is that before you go into the interview, it's very important that you know your audience. It's, you can totally okay to ask, who am I interviewing with? What are their positions? If you know you're meeting with the CEO, with the business managers, or you're meeting with an engineer, or you're meeting with game designers, right? They all care about different things. So you, you should be prepared to talk to all those different people, right? And so if you ask, they'll tell you who you're gonna talk to. Um, Generally, in the interview, just so everybody knows, other than just can this person do this job and can they do it well, the most important thing people are trying to figure out is can I work with this person? Um, and 
after that is what is this person ceiling you know if i hire this junior designer can they be creative director if i hire this junior engineer you know is that are they going to be a junior engineer i don't want to hire a junior engineer that's going to end up a junior engineer right so you you have to understand that it's more about who you are than what you can do you need to pass the what you can do test and you need to be able to do what you're telling them that you they can do you can do, but it's also very important that you show that you're a good person, that you can work with them, that you can collaborate. Um, and one of the questions that everybody hates that you'll get is why do you want to work for us, right? Why do you want to work for Machine Zone? Um, you have to know what people are really asking there. They're asking, are you here for the money? They're asking, are you passionate about what you're doing? And do you know what you want to do? Because nobody wants to hire someone who doesn't really know what they want to do. I know we said that you know the journey goes every which way, but at every point, I know what I wanted to do. It might not be where I ended up, but you have to know what you want to do, and people can see through that. Um, so you can answer questions, but the best thing you can do is to have stories, because stories show that you've been through it, and they show that you know what you're doing. And if somebody says, uh, have you built a game before? And you're like, yes. Okay, tell me more about it. They'll know, you'll, you'll, you're, your stories are really the key to the interview there. And one of my favorite parts in any interview is to allow people to ask questions. And for me, I can actually tell a person's character by the questions they ask. So have your questions ready. It's OK to ask the technical questions like, what software will I be using? Um, you know, will I get a computer? How many days off do I get? All those are fine questions, but asking questions about like the work, about what you will be doing, the trajectory of the company shows your character. It shows who you really are and what you want to do. Um, and one of the last questions that I like to ask that you should be prepared for is, if I hired you today and let you do whatever you wanted to do, what would you do and what problem would you solve? And so that shows that the person knows what they want to do and knows what they're doing, right? So, you know, I could go in and say, I would want to be a product manager and I would want to talk to all the stakeholders and understand what they need and all the users and understand what they need and then talk to UX. But the problem that I want to solve is automation because I love automation. I love making people do more. That, that shows that you really do have passion. And even if they don't ask you that question, you should be really ready to give that to somebody because it shows that you know what you want and that you're passionate about what you're doing. So soft skills. So my current job is almost all soft skills. I am a very technical product manager. I can do analysis. I can do some coding. You know, I know data. I know some data science. But most of my day is spent with my soft skills. Um, cal collaboration and social skills are super impro important. Even the best engineers have to be collaborative. You know. Um, I, what I tend to like to do is I tend to surround myself with people that are very intelligent and I sell them on my idea, I sell them. You as a designer will have to do that. You have to get the engineers to believe in you, to want to be designers as well. Um, and you know, no matter how smart you are and no matter how good you are at something, to really make an impact, you're gonna have to work with people. You know, I've never seen anybody that was able to do something by themselves. You know, you might be able to like come up with the idea and you might be able to do the beginning, but there's back end, there's visuals, there's marketing, there's business, you need a team. So all these social skills matter. And the two most important social skills that I see are really trust and clout, right? And so those come from being able to deliver what you say you're going to deliver. So, you know, you tell somebody you're going to help somebody with something, you help them with something, and that develops your clout. You deliver something, and that develops your clout, but it's something you constantly work on. And gaining trust is extremely important because that allows people to keep working with you. And one of the last things that I want to point out that you is you have to socialize a lot of your decisions. So, you know, you decide to use, I don't know if, well, 
if any of you guys watch Silicon Valley here, but there's been literally points in that show where they're like, oh, they're using, you know, nanoseconds versus milliseconds. That's a decision that somebody made that somebody has to go tell somebody and make sure everybody in the room is aligned and everybody's using the same thing, right? So you have to, you have to be ready to also get buy-in. You know, a lot of my day is spent talking to the director of engineering and trying to say, I have this idea for automation. This is how it's going to work. It's like selling them on my idea so I can get them to give me five engineers to work on my project for five months, you know, and these, and I've spent a lot of time working at Machine Zone, and I've delivered a lot of things, but I still find myself constantly trying to convince people to work with me, and it's fine, it's, it's, some, it's part of my job, but it's also, when you see the end result, it's amazing, it's amazing. Um, so there's a couple of tools of the trade that help with these social aspects of the job. One is source control. I learned that at Santa Cruz Games. So learn your source control. It's super important from, with everything, from documents to actual Git to things you turn in. You're, learn your source control. Bug tracking. Um, every company uses bug tracking. They use Jira. There's other bug tracking software, Wiki, wikis. Uh, it's important to know what to write and what not to write. You don't want to write big wikis that are information about everything you need to know, but you want to write enough to where all the important points get through, and if they need to talk to you, they can come talk to you, because like I said, this is a huge collaboration. You might be able to make a game with four people, but even those four people need to be able to understand what's going on, and your future self also has to know what you were thinking, you know, before. And the most boring part is paper trails, but paper trails are super important because it's about decisions and accountability, right? You're making decisions every moment that you're doing anything, right? You're making decisions about your code, you're making decisions about what art to use, you're making decisions about the flow of your game, and so you need to make sure that you are accountable for those decisions and everybody else is accountable, and you can go back to the moment that you made that decision and figure out what's wrong, right? I, I review things that went wrong like once a week and just try to figure out what went wrong and then say, okay, we're not gonna do this wrong again. How do we not do this wrong again? That documentation and having all those, all that paper trail really helps. It's not really about blaming anybody. Um, one little anecdote that I have from my dad is that, you know, he would always say, what's the most important quality of any person? And, you know, the answer was be intelligent. And then right after that, he would go, but what's more important? He would, yes, you're right, but what's more important? And then it would be, be social. And he said, yes, because when you're social, you're actually as smart as everybody else in the room. You know, have the community. Like, it's, it's extremely important. You can actually get further within a community, and you can get further. And people at work, for me, are my community. And I, I work really closely with them. I haven't had a chance to work with Brendan yet, but, you know, I'll get there. <laughs> One day. Yeah, part of, I think, soft skills also is that, again, in offices, there is, like, you will end up with some sort of politics. I think this is also where paper trails help, especially when you're starting off and you're the young person. You're going to be the easy fall guy for every problem, you know. Hopefully, it's used, as Danny's using it, to, to, to you know, improve the process. But that there is, a, you know, that's also something to consider. Again, with the soft skills help with sort of office politics. Yeah, so the, the other flip side of paper trails, too, is that if you're working for any sort of larger company, um, if you use their chat or you use their email, everything you write is set in stone, and they keep it forever. And it's very easy to do something non-work related or send something that one of your up, upper level higher management people might not like or agree with, and it could end up getting you fired pretty easily. So just watch out. Uh, work is work, keep work stuff at work, keep personal stuff outside of work, and you, got, you guys will be fine. Uh, yeah, I had a question about, um, in my college career, I've been involved in politics and activist work, and I'm, I'm wondering, because I'm looking to be software engineer, like uh, how if to incorporate that, or, or should I add that to my resume? Or you know, it's a big part of who I am, but I don't know how to talk about it because you know 
uh, po politics might rub some people the wrong way or yeah, I think that's really kind of a case-by-case -case basis thing. Uh, it depends on where you're trying to get a job uh, and how they might view that. So unfortunately, I can't give broad advice there. Uh, I know, you know our company, Machine Zone, is all about keeping anything at all political out of the office and out of conversation. And so they'll literally you know, send warnings out if they see anything political in chat or an email. Um, so you got to be careful, definitely. Um, but are you, are you also asking, you know, you know, are you trying to seek out a job related to that? Or uh, are you just saying you, you want to express just that? Like, I mean, I, I acquired skills that, you know, perhaps someone might, uh, you know, like or want. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly how to spin that, um, you know, because I feel like I'm an organizer of people and I know how to deal with institutions and dealing with you know people that have different political opinions than I do but like we still collaborate like I feel like there's there's skills that I could apply in different contexts but I don't know how to spin that without alienating yeah I mean that's the important part right you have skills you've learned these skills um, bring your skills to the for forefront right uh, I don't know what you organized, but you know, let's say you organized something. I organized a hundred people to go march against Apple. You know, might not fall really well with people reading your resume, but I organized a hundred people. You know, to to rally, or I use social media to do X. You know, those are things that that you have done. So it's all about you can remove the information that might be incendiary, that might get people to turn off, but the skill is what's important, right? If people know that you have the ability to organize or people know that you have the ability to wade through bureaucracy, you know, that's super useful. And in the end, you know, as I've seen with engineers that are at CTO, VP level, right? It is it is more about that organization skill and more about understanding what is right and what is wrong and understanding about how to get engineers to do the things that you need them to do and less about the like technical portions. And I, I know this because I've interviewed a lot of directors of engineering not being technical myself, but you know, I know the things I have to ask them and I have to ask them things like, when there's an issue with your system, what do you do? And if they didn't answer, email everybody that uses my system right away, they're an obvious no, right? And that's not necessarily something that an engineer automatically knows, but I bet you that somebody who's an organizer knows to email everybody if something's gonna go wrong, right? So it's the skills that matter. You know, maybe you omit some of the things that that company, like Simmer said, tailor the resume, right? But I'm sure that it's nothing that crazy or that bad, and your skills are what matter at that point. Um, I wanted to ask you a quick question about um, what was the, the two things? It was trust and clout. Um, can you just go more, or like, give us more detail about that um, in terms of like, why are those two things important? Well, I mean, I'm hoping that I don't have to explain too much about why trust is important. Well, yeah, trust, but, um, <laughs> you know, the clout part. Yeah, the clout part. So the clout part, you know, I can, I, so like I said, I've done a lot at Machine Zone, you know, and and you can go back and people can specifically say, okay, Danny built this, Danny built that. Uh, Danny worked on this huge initiative. And so when I have that and I can go into a room, there's many engineers that don't know me or haven't, right? The engineering director will have prepped them and said, okay, Danny built this system. He was able to do this, you know. I have conversations with the CEO. I have conversations with the um, chief revenue officer. So. Clout is really just about uh, having people understand what you've done before and knowing that you can do it again, right? It's like it's like being a you know movie actor or somebody in sports. Like 
when they're choosing you, sure, they, they don't know if you're actually going to be able to do it again, but they can look at what you've done before, right? And if people are willing to say, yes, I believe in you, and I guess that's what it is, is have people believe in you. And the way you have people believe in you is by consistently doing things well, right? And delivering. So you want to deliver, and when you say you do want to do something, that's how you get trust, right? I'm going to give you this analysis tomorrow, and you deliver that analysis, and it's correct. That gives you trust, right? And the clout comes with just being able to consistently deliver and consistently deliver, and people will trust you, and they will, again, believe in what you're trying to do. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so cleaning up your social media. This is, uh, again, this this is supposed to be practical. So this is, uh, you know, I think most of the millennials are, seem to be much more aware of this stuff. Uh, I think there was definitely a certain generation, like MySpace, where, uh, <laughs> you know, there's uh, things unearthed that maybe people would rather they weren't. Um, but yeah, one of uh, Danny and my, one of our, our friends, actually, she was a poli-sci professor at UCLA, and uh, she was, hired by uh, somebody who uh, basically worked uh, one step away from President Obama, and she was, she was right underneath that person. And she was mainly hired just for uh, making social media policy. Uh, and it's just, I mean, part of this is because the, you know, the, uh, for government work, they don't necessarily want you leaking uh, secrets, but it's also about uh, presentation uh, you know the what you what you put forward, uh, and again, it's not just being fake. It's really just putting your best foot forward. You know, it's uh, I don't think any, uh, you know, it's uh, no one's telling you that you should you should be something that you're not. Um, uh, you know, we we've all done really dumb stuff, and uh, it's better it's just done in private. I think, uh, you know, it's maturity. It's it's something you grow into. Uh, it's not you know, no one expects you to be. Uh, no, 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 16 year old or 19 year old is perfect by any means. Um, you know, and there's other things like there's, uh, you know, you could, uh, people, uh, we have, uh, you know, there's, we've seen some people who just use it, um, social media just maybe to complain or something, right? So Twitter is completely open. If you're one of the, these people, as Danny mentioned before, you know, part of the thing that people at these interviews are trying to see is if they want to work with you. Now, if they just see everything that you have is just, oh, you know, screw this, screw that, that you know, it's not really, uh, it's, maybe it's not conducive. I mean, hopefully you can turn that into something positive instead, right? Like, uh, in, instead, if you're posting, you know, uh, if, if, if you have, uh, if, you, if you have articles or some thoughts on something that's going on, you know, with current games, maybe loot boxes, of course, you know, loot boxes was a big issue that uh, all of games dealt with, you know, last year. How fair is that? So that that's something you can certainly you should have opinions on if you're a designer for sure. Um, uh, you know, uh, if you're visiting national parks, you know people you, the, the, you want it, you want to put your best foot forward. If it, people see that you're you know you're interested in these kind of things, so that's you obviously you know you show the side of that people will want to actually interact with and you know hopefully hire on. Yeah, just. Think. Put, your, put yourself in the shoes of someone looking at your social media profile and determining if you're a good fit for the job. Uh, and if, if you were running the company, would you want to hire this person? So, you know, it's okay to have social media and uh, you know, be out there and have a presence, but just be realistic about it and just have common sense. I think that's just the most important thing. Um, you know, don't, don't come off as too immature. Uh, just present yourself professionally. Um, and at least don't have too much public stuff out there like Facebook should be friends only. Uh, if you, I, I went back and deleted all my tweets like a while ago just so they don't exist anymore. Um, you know, because there was embarrassing stuff that seemed really immature. Uh, but at the time I was like 18, 19. Um, so, you know, I changed a lot and I didn't want that out there anymore. So there's stuff you can do to, to clean it up, but just watch yourself in general. So you've chosen a career, you've found a job, and now how do you be successful at that job? And 
that's the journey part of it. The, the first part is you know, just getting your feet wet, stepping into it and figuring it out. And then you have years and years ahead of you to be successful. And hopefully everybody wants to be successful and kind of reach their peak and, and be the, the you know, top of what they, what they can be. Um, so the most important part of that, I think, and I think we all agree, is uh, connections. And so Simmer is going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's, uh, again, as I mentioned before, for, for games, um, there is a, a conferences, a, a GDC uh, that just happened two weeks ago. So um, there, some people had asked me before, uh, people who had just graduated, some who were just getting into college, you know, I'm interested in getting into games, like what should I do? Like there's an expo pass for the GDC floor. And again, there's booths from every company that you could imagine there. And you can just go talk, you know, talk to them, what, what are they looking for? Um, and again, PAX, like PAX is, it's much more informal than GDC, but still, you know, that there's something good about that in, informality. You know, you can actually, again, you're, you're trying to make friends. Uh, I think most of the time when people uh, hear the, the word networking, certainly Danny and I early on, when we'd hear the word networking, it just had sort of a weird negative connotation to us because it's almost like schmoozing, kind of being fake and whatever. But it really, when it comes down to it, you're making friends. And that's all it is. Um, so uh, that's you know the uh, you you uh, you should help uh, other people if you have the chance. Uh, that's that's another thing. Again, uh, you know, not expect necessarily for it to come back to you, but certainly it could. You know, just uh, so these are these are uh, um, uh, you know you, you can. So. Yeah, I would just like to drive home the making friends part of it. You know, it's it's super important. So. Networking, just pretend you're going to a party somewhere off campus in your hometown, whatever. You don't go there thinking, I'm going to use this person, I'm going to do this, I'm, right? You're just there to have fun and meet people and meet like-minded people. Hey, I might go to this party and then, you know, oh, I met some guy that likes Frisbee golf. Now we're going to go to the Frisbee golf course up here in Santa Cruz, right? Like that's what it is when you go out networking, right? You're just talking to people and this person likes match three games, you have something to talk about, all of a sudden, you know, you're working in, together with them on a match three game. Um, you know, Brendan and Simmer are my best friends and I've brought in some of my best friends, other friends into Machine Zone. And it's not because they're my friends that I brought them in, but it's just, they were there because they were my friends, right? And I made friends, we had things to talk about. So again, don't make it fake. Just pretend you're meeting somebody here at UC Santa Cruz and try to see if you have something in common and you might not with a lot of people and you might with a lot of people. And it's a marathon, you know, you're just meeting random people and becoming friends with them. Don't have an agenda, don't have something you want out of them. And just like we are with your friends, like Simmer said, help them and it'll come back, it'll pay it forward, I guess. And so given that you have enough connections and uh, you've gotten yourself acclimated with a, the industry you want to be in, um, one of the things that I think is really important once you start a career and start progressing in that career is to never stop learning. and. Unfortunately, you graduated college. I think the last thing you want to do is have it feel more like college. Um, but when I say never stop learning, I don't mean you know taking more courses and going to class. I mean trying to better yourself and further your knowledge uh, through your own research or any anything that really interests you. It, it could also be a hobby um, because you know even even hobbies are sorry yeah even hobbies and uh, unrelated. Uh, fields of research can contribute to your success in your career. And so uh, in my career, I, I intentionally try to, to seek out new knowledge. I try to learn new technologies, uh, new programming languages. Um, I go, go back and review computer science uh, when I want to refresh my skills. And so I just try and keep everything sharp. And I would say at least once a month, I'm learning something new uh, related to my job. Um, and part of that is out of necessity, and the other part of that is out of just you know, passion for the work and wanting to further my skill set and further my knowledge. Um, and it, it's, it's very rewarding because you know, it, it's, it not only helps you in your career because it gives you a bigger skill set, but you know, if, if it's part of your passion, 
then you're making progress there and you're just, you're fueling your, your drive that keeps you going. Um, and as you learn more, I think one of the things that's interesting is um, you start feeling less intelligent the more you know. And it's something that I've definitely recognized in my career is I started out um, probably a little bit too cocky for the level I was at. And you know I thought I knew a lot and I didn't know a lot. Uh, but I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And as I started to learn more, I started to realize, oh, there's all this stuff that I, I don't know about. And now I know that exists, but I don't know about it. Uh, and it's kind of a scary feeling because you feel like overwhelmed and like the, I'm never gonna get there. Uh, but it, what it really means is you're just getting smarter. And now you actually have more knowledge that's gonna help you to do the right thing instead of the wrong thing. And so now you don't, to take on a huge project and then get lost because there are a bunch of unknowns you didn't know about. Now you know about those and you can avoid them or circumvent them and do the, the better method or the, the, the easier method. Um, so just know that you know, if you start getting that feeling of, oh, I, I, don't, I don't feel as smart as I should be, like it's probably a good thing that you're feeling that way. Uh, and keep seeking that out and keep, keep trying to, to strive to learn more and more and more and understand about, uh, about your, your career and skill set. Um, and then if you're in technology specifically, I would say uh, try to keep up with new technology, like um, new tech stacks, new programming languages, uh, anything that's kind of going to give you an edge uh, in your career. Just, you know, just read articles, read white papers. Uh, there's, there's universities doing research in certain areas. Um, actually, just a couple weeks ago, I found a white paper that totally applies to something I was thinking about, but really hadn't developed fully in terms of what I wanted to do with it. But I found a white paper that some university was working on that completely matched uh, what I was thinking about, and that really helped me along. And now I have a much better idea of how I'm going to go about doing this thing. Uh, so there's, there's lots of resources out there that can help you progress um, that you, you really wouldn't get if, unless you're seeking it out. We just lost the connection. Yeah, we're having some technical difficulties, sorry. Keep going. Yeah. I don't, I don't think you need Wi Fi just for the video. Uh, that's it. Do we have the slide? Yeah, that's what I was just looking at. Right. Yeah, well, so the next slide is uh, don't be afraid to fail. Um, and this sounds, yeah. this sounds, it sounds counterintuitive, but almost any type of failure is actually some sort of success because you're making progress in failing, you're learning in the process. And you failed your goal, but you've learned so much along the way that the next time you go about it, you're gonna make less mistakes, you're gonna have a better idea of uh, your limitations, and just a much easier path to getting where you need to get to. And it may take a couple tries, but eventually you're gonna reach the point where you've, you've gained enough knowledge along the way that you're gonna be successful, um, and there's, different reasons for failure. I mean, it could just be ignorance of the problem, uh, underdevelopment, poor planning, bad communication. There's all sorts of things that lead to, to failure of a goal. Um, but you know, all of those different reasons each teach you something different. Um, so it, as long as you're failing quickly, I think Facebook's motto was fail fast, fail often, or something like that, uh, or fail fast to break things. Um, but it, it's it's really true. Like it, you're getting to where you need to get faster by failing. And if you're afraid to fail, then it means you're never going to take on that challenge, and you're never going to gain that knowledge that you would have gained if you had tried and failed to do it. Uh, so it really limits your potential if you don't kind of go for things once in a while and go out of your comfort zone and try and tackle something that you normally wouldn't. Um, when I started SCG uh, at Santa Cruz Games. Uh, I, I walked in the door and uh, I talked to the owner of the company and he sat me down and said, he put, he put a board in front of me, a circuit board in front of me, and it was for a plug and play TV game. And I, I'd never seen one of these things in my life before in terms of programming, like I'd done PC programming and uh, I was doing some XNA stuff on, on Xbox. Um, but you know, I, I'd never used this before and he asked me, he's like, does this look familiar? And I just said, yes. And, it didn't, like I'd never seen this thing. Um, but I told myself, okay, you're just gonna do this. He's like, we need to make this game and you're the only programmer available. 
And so I was basically being hired because everyone else was busy and they needed to put this game out as quickly as possible. And so I said, okay, I'll do it. And he's like, okay, great. And he just walked away. Like no instruction, nothing. Uh, and you know, emailing people, trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, what do I have to do next? Uh, I'm trying to get people that have used this board to, to tell me about it and like, where's the user manual. Um, but eventually I actually succeeded. Like I, I, you know, I, I thought I was gonna fail and I succeeded because I pushed myself to do it. Uh, and in the process, I learned how to program this board. I learned a lot about lower level programming in C and it really built my skill set and allowed me to expand out uh, versus if I had been hesitant and said no, or no, I don't think I can do it, give me something smaller. I need to start on some smaller project or something like that. Um, you know, I, I would be in a much more limited position where my skills were not growing and you know, I, I would just be you know, lower on the totem pole overall uh, if I had not done that. And so I really think you have to take risks. Uh, you have to be outside your comfort zone. And this doesn't just apply to tech, uh, just any sort of career. I think if you take on additional responsibility, uh, you know, don't be afraid to fail at it because you know, it's gonna grow you in some way. You might surprise yourself. Um, and uh, for you know, success, it's, it is about the, 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 uh, the long haul, the big picture. Um, so you gotta make, uh, you know, set, set aside some time to reflect on these things. Uh, are you going in the right direction? Again, once you've gotten your first job, maybe, um, you know, it paid nicely, but maybe it's not what you wanna do, or maybe it didn't pay so well, so you want another one that, that will, or, um, or you've, you know, changed in that time, you know, certainly as you, as you uh, get older, uh, th things that you enjoyed, uh, you know, when you're younger, uh, I played around in, lo in a lot of bands growing up. It's certainly not something I'd necessarily want to, you know, go on a touring schedule now at all. So, um, you know, th these kind of, uh, but it's, uh, you know, um, always, you, you have to kind of keep reevaluating. I mean, I think this is not just, the, you know, the, the Maslow came up with something great here. The there's there these kind of lower things when you, you start getting into deep into uh, you know crunch time, which happens kind of uh, certainly in tech quite often. Um, and uh, there, you know there was a, we we made a game a, a Superman game in 2006, um, and uh, it started off yeah, easy enough, uh, and very quickly we're working seven days a week, and uh, and there was a, a point at which a few months after that where uh, everybody started to develop an eye twitch. So we would just walk around the room and everybody had just this one eye that was just, you know, and it was just, it was, it was, it spread like crazy. And it took months after the game was finished for that to go away. You know, just so much kind of stress and that. So uh, uh, if you keep doing that too long again, it's just, you'll burn yourself out. You know, I, I started to get migraines and I noticed that it's not when I'm necessarily making music on my computer because, you know, with that, you're maybe kind of listening and you kind of close your eyes maybe and play uh, keyboards or whatever. Um, but when I'm coding, certainly, I'm just looking at the screen and I'm just thinking about what I need to do and and I can just get lo lost in there for hours and you know, 14 hours have passed or something. And so I, I've, I don't know if you noticed that a little bit earlier when everything was going wrong here. Uh, there's a program that I use that's just reminds me to take a break, um, maybe get up and stretch and walk around and. And that, that's been just so helpful to me because, uh, again, uh, I was, I was uh, uh, looking at getting medication otherwise, so I'd, which I'd rather not take. Yeah, one thing I would like to point out is everybody here has probably been on an airplane probably in the last 20 years, and you see that insert and literally shows a lady like putting the mask on herself before she puts the mask on her daughter or baby son. Um, you should really think about it that way. You know, you, you have these games or this job or whatever you're doing, and that's your baby, that's your son, that's your daughter. But if you don't put the mask on yourself first, you're not gonna be able to put the mask on them. And that's what, that's what taking care of yourself comes out to. You know, I'm always a big proponent, at least for myself, to get enough sleep because I've seen what people do when they don't get enough sleep, you know. I've seen mistakes that have cost way too much money because somebody really needed to get this done and they kept working and they kept working and they kept working and as Simmer said, I've seen people physically 
uh, make themselves ill because they're working too much, but really you have to understand that you are the most important thing in this whole equation, and you're actually the thing that makes everything come out, right? Without that, it's without you, it's not going to go along, right? Okay, sure, maybe the company will keep working, but your whatever you're working on needs you, so you have to take care of yourself. Um, anywhere from like taking care of yourself with sleep, or taking care of yourself with um, you know eating healthy, or taking care of yourself spiritually. However, you need to take care of yourself. Make sure you do take care of yourself because in the end, it's you who is producing everything. So this is very important. Self care is super duper important. Don't let it go. It will pay off in the long run. I know, you know, not to be cliche, but I was young too. At some point, I was like, whoa, life is like now catching up to me. I have to take care of myself. If I don't ca take care of myself, I can see like death running after me and I'm like <laughs> walking, right? And I need to run a little bit faster today. And so that's, that's what it's about. You need to take care of yourself so you can take care of your family, your projects, and everything that you need to take care of. But yourself first, then everything else. Yeah, uh, so we're only in our 30s, and we're already talking to each other about our joints aching and our backs hurting. So just, just watch out. It comes much sooner than you expect. Uh, you're gonna wake up one day and you're gonna you know, throw it out your shoulder by sleeping wrong, and it's, uh, it's just all bad. So definitely, definitely take care of yourself. Uh, for me, it was, going to the gym. Uh, that's probably the second best decision I've ever made. I know Simmer goes out running a lot, goes on walks, uh, just gets outdoors quite a bit. You know, anything that's going to just de-stress you and uh, take away the the day-to-day -day, um, uh, stressors that really add to just overall health uh, degradation over time. So, Yeah, and that can be also actually, I was going to mention that uh, one of the things that happened after Danny and I moved uh, to San Francisco was there were these mixers and events going on constantly, um, and a lot of them have free booze. And so it's very easy to get into that cycle as well. And I learned very quickly, you kind of want to limit like maybe a couple of days. Okay, that's fine. And the third day, you, you know, you can choose not to drink. If, if you have, you know, there, there's things that you have to kind of keep up with this. Like even on the, on the fun side of it, you got to temper that a bit as well. Yeah. And we have a few closing remarks that we just want to leave you guys with. Uh, so Simmer uh, pointed out this tripod of success to us and talked about it the other day. But at first, this image was just a stool. Uh, but I wanted to change it to the, the Strider from Half-Life 2. It's much better. Much better tripod. Uh, so it's hard work, ability, and luck. And we're each going to go over uh, kind of what that means to us and talk about it from our perspective. Yeah, this is stolen from uh, an idea that Walter Murch had, who's a famous sound designer, film editor. So hard work. Um, I think for me, um, the best example of this was when I joined Machine Zone initially, and it was just a little startup. Uh, everyone was wearing many different hats, and no one really had a like, direct assigned role to do anything. But we needed to make this company successful. We needed to take the limited money we had and make a product and make it valuable to the shareholders or to the investors. Uh, so it was four or five people for the first uh, year or so, and then we, we grew to maybe uh, 10 or 15 the first three years. Uh, but during those first three years, um, it was 16-hour days every single day, no weekends, no vacations, nothing. And the only reason I did that was because I was passionate about it, and I believed in the products, I believed in the company, um, and this is kind of where I learned that you do need to take care of yourself is going through this experience. But at the same time, it's actually the most rewarding part of my life that I've been through thus far is making this company successful. Uh, and it took a ton of hard work to do. And I got stressed out. I started having massive headaches out of nowhere. Uh, I was at the doctor all the time. Uh, you didn't hang out with us? Yeah, I was, I was rarely seen. Um, just, it's just blank in my mind at this point. Um, but, you know, I, I worked very, very hard because I, I knew I was invested in the company and I knew what potential it had. And to be able to have realized that potential and see it as successful as it is now, I mean, we made three 
top grossing iOS and Android games that hit number one on the top grossing charts out of a company of four people uh, is just incredible experience. And I'm very lucky to have been a part of that. And I can directly attribute the hard work that we all put in during those first few years to that success. And I don't, I'm not gonna condone uh, trying to sacrifice your health to, for working 16 hour days with no breaks at all. You probably shouldn't do that. Um, but you know, at some point you're gonna have to push yourself and work to get uh, or to achieve the goal you wanna achieve. So, um, yeah, the next one, uh, the, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just had a question about, um, yeah, dealing with crunch um, because, I mean, if you're working 16 hours a day, I can imagine at some point you hit, uh, you get diminishing returns and then you're actually probably like, uh, you know, yeah, there, it's probably uh, having a negative effect at some point. Um, like, wh where do you draw that line? Like, how how do you figure that out? Like, you want to show that you can work hard, but like physiologically, like you have to take care of yourself. Otherwise, yeah, you're just going to start making mistakes and probably going to be more of a liability. Yeah, that's actually a great point, and I actually now I feel bad for not talking about it. Um, so, at this point, I think all three of us recognize that there are diminishing returns uh, just from having experienced it. And uh, in Santa Cruz Games, this happened. Early days of Machine Zone, this happened. Um, and you know, it was out of necessity at the time, but it uh, doesn't discount that, yes, we were probably making tons of mistakes. And I, I think we can attribute a lot of those mistakes to staying up way too late, working way too many hours. Um, and now, personally, like that's why I don't do it anymore. Um, I think the threshold is probably a day or two of that, and that's that's it. Like after that, you're just you're not effective at all. Like if you're if you're getting two or three or four hours of sleep a night, uh, you're not going to be refreshed. Your brain's not going to be uh, working at 100% capacity. So uh, usually when we encounter that, um, you know, I think everybody at the company now understands that that's not realistic anymore, especially at the size that it is, to have expect everybody to do that. And so um, we, we now have like on call and shift working and things like that that help alleviate that problem. Uh, whereas before we just didn't have the resources to do that. Everybody kind of was forced to, to work that much. Um, but yes, I would totally agree that you are at completely diminished capacity when you're, when you're doing crunch time. So it should only be in short spurts as needed. And you know, sometimes it's unavoidable. I'll definitely say that. Like you have to get a product out the door the next day or the day after, like you're gonna have to do it. But as long as it's only for short periods of time, I think it's okay. Yeah, I mean, I found uh, like with certain times when you're just trying to finish, get just get something just to the point where it's done, you kind of just naturally do this a bit, or I, f I find myself doing this, because uh, sometimes when you when you are sort of doing the you know uh, eight hour schedule, okay, I'm done for the day kind of thing, it's it's hard to really kind of like say with writing music, I mean, or or anything, you know, but just, sometimes you just kind of have to get it to that point. And again, like Brendan said, I think if it's more than a few days, then you know, you're, it's going to be tough to keep that up. So one of the um, early IT people at Machine Zone got me into sprint running, and he was teaching me how to do sprint running, and we, we had this, this method of, you know, you do a half-mile jog, and then you sprint for a quarter of a mile, and then you walk or jog the next quarter of a mile, and you do that four times. And I went back to him, I'm like, Anthony, I'm not getting better at this. Like, seriously, I'm just not getting better at this. I can't, I can't, the third sprint is just, I'm not getting any faster. And overall, like when I average them out, they're not faster. And he's like, how fast is your first sprint? And I tell him, how fast is your second sprint? And it's like one second slower. And he's like, how fast is your third sprint? And it's like four seconds slower. And he's like, well, that's your problem. Don't sprint super fast at the beginning. He's like, just, Sprint like you do your third sprint in your first sprint and your last sprint put it all there and That totally changed how fast I was able to sprint on that last sprint and That just made me think like, you know, you have to To not get burned out you have to like start 
early, not get to the point where you're burning out and then make that decision, right? And if you're running, you do know when you can't do it anymore, right? So you should be able to say, okay, I'm starting slow and then I'm sprinting fast. But the other thing on being able to make the decision on whether you should keep going or not keep going, one, don't let your body tell you no first, but also look at what you're trying to do. So I have this way of evaluating things and I ask myself, is there binary pass failure here, right? If I don't deliver this by Monday, is all the work lost? Or if I deliver it on Monday night, do I get 70%, right? If all the work is lost, then yes, maybe you should try to get it done as long as your body is not failing you. But if delivering it Tuesday or if not delivering it or delivering 70% of it, you still get 70% of that, then it's okay. Go take a break, go take a nap, go eat, go do whatever you need to do because in the end, you still get some of it out of it and it's not as important as what you're gonna lose in the future. Uh, so the other, one of the other legs is uh, talent. And that's, I think it's, uh, again, for success, hard work, you kind of hard work and talent sort of, uh, I think there's, a, uh, you know, a lot of times I've noticed with my friends who are musicians kind of growing up, there was always a time where they would just kind of lock themselves away and just work at whatever their instrument was. And then, the, you know, they kind of come out of it sort of proficient uh, at a different level. And I think if you, if you, you know, and that, that's, a, it's, a, it's that hard work that you put in, but if you don't kind of have some natural inc talent and this inclination, then it doesn't really, it's hard to get very far with that. So, you, you know, it's, uh, uh, there's, a, there's, you know, people, people think that, uh, you know, some, you know some, some people are certainly born genius. I've met, I've met a few in my, in my time now who are just, they're, I don't understand how they have these abilities just completely naturally. But I think for most people, there is this long sort of time that you have to spend that 10,000 hour rule. Um, where where you're just working, uh, you know, on whatever it is that you're trying to hone, and uh, again, having that natural ability, I think, you know, you can. If you're if you're a horrible singer, hopefully, you know, you'll 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 see your video of uh, at some point or hear this and go, man, maybe it's not for me, maybe. Uh, and but for the most time, I think if you've gotten to a certain uh, place with this stuff, then you've had some positive reinforcement with it. Um, yeah, and so I think that there is a bit of this kind of, uh, in the town, there is a bit of this sort of devotion and, uh, you know, this natural inclination that plays into 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 this part of, uh, this third of the tripod of success. Yeah, so this one tends to be like the one I hate and love the most. Yeah. And I hate it because I'm a math major and you, you, math is certain, right? Math is certain. Okay, you can have probabilities, but it's certain, it's certain. And I hate the lottery, right? I kind of like poker. You can tell, like, I don't want luck to be a factor, but luck has been a factor in my life so much. And so what I realized, you know, when people would say, oh, good luck, I'd be like, Arr. Well, you should just say good skill, right? Like, but what, what I realized what luck is, is luck is everything out of your control, right? When you're playing a board game or a game and that deck of cards is sitting there and you shuffled, you've given away your control to that deck. Everything in your hand is what you can control and the way you play it is what you can control. But your next card and all the things that everybody around you is gonna play is out of con your control and that is the luck, right? Does that person have the ace? Does that person, you know, is that person gonna play really dumbly and it's gonna like make everything go wrong for me, right? Am I gonna like walk out this door and have a meteorite hit me? Like these things are all out of your control and so what I have to say about luck is you know, be prepared. Be prepared to receive luck. When things appear, be prepared. When I saw that article and I read it, I was prepared to go and apply. I was prepared to change what I was doing, right? My 
roommate picking up City on the Hill was the luck part of that equation. Um, also be open, you know, be open, put yourself in different situations. Don't say no to anything that's not really gonna hurt you and that will put you into situations in which you can be lucky. And I think the most important part about luck is that it gives you hope. Luck gives you hope, right? Like I can be losing completely losing. I don't know how many sports fans are around here, right? But you can be completely losing. And because of luck, you get that one out, right? That gets you there, and then you win the game, right? I've had that happen so many times. I've had it happen so many times. Actually, when um, I was looking for jobs, I didn't even think about emailing Brendan or talking to Brendan. I knew he worked at, which at the time was admired, right? And I'm looking through it and looking through LinkedIn, I believe, and it said admired, and I know like my brain was like, what what is admired? I know something about admired. And me and Brendan like had known each other what for six years at that point. We hung out maybe once a month before then in Santa Cruz. We were seeing each other every day. But for some reason admired didn't register. But the moment it registered, I was just like, oh my God, I'm emailing Brendan. So just remember that what luck gives you is it gives you hope. And so just be ready to receive it. Uh, put yourself in those situations. And without it, you know, you're not going to get as far as you can. Like, you need it to be on your side. You need everything you can't control to be on your side. So I hope you guys all good luck and good skill <laughs> and that you guys will work hard. So, all right. There's uh, yeah, just one final small thing. Uh, it's uh, s some thoughts that Nadia Boulanger had on uh, music uh, that I think sum up everything pretty nicely. For us, it's a mystery. I don't know why I love music. I don't know what music is. Genius, I don't even speak of it. We are as fools, we say, he's a genius. We want to say that he attains something from which is at the highest point of sensation, feeling, belief, knowledge, attachment. It's a very important thing. And it's why when you are teaching, you are very concerned. Hey, have I not encouraged too many people? That's the only thing you fear. So when I see a young pupil, my first question is, can you live without music? If you can live without music, thank the Lord and goodbye. Because it's only if it is unavoidable that you must do music. But you can never love music with enough devotion. If not, you make a mistake. You engage your life in marrying somebody that you don't love. It's not a good idea, I think. I don't know, I've never been married. But somebody who wants to do it will never be discouraged. I will discourage him. But she will go in the street alone to somebody else, but she will do it. The one that you must push will never do anything. <laughs> Repetition on FD, which I would play with the little, I would not make the diminuendo so slow, so slow. Play from Paris. All right, so that's that's all our advice to you guys. And now, if you guys have any questions for us, please feel free. Uh, we're happy to answer them. Uh, and. We'll be around, we'll stick around for a little while afterwards. If you guys want to talk one-on-one -on -one or anything, uh, feel free to come up and chit-chat for a bit. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Any questions? So, so these portfolios, um, when, when you were applying to places, uh, how much was in your portfolio? Because I feel like, I mean, it could just be me. But um, so how much was in your portfolio when you started applying places? Because a lot of times it almost feels like I don't have anything in there. But when you think about it, I feel like there's a lot more things you could add. 
I just want to know what level did you feel you were on when you applied? Sure. Um, so for me, uh, I had done, I had actually been trying out a couple different disciplines. So I uh, was trying art for a little bit. I'm not a good artist, I, I realized, uh, but I did have some random art that I'd made. Um, I was doing 3D modeling um, and then mostly programming aside from that. So I had made a couple applications. So I had a, a Java application um, that uh, allowed you to chat and file transfer. Um, I had two very simple puzzle games that I'd made and then a couple 3D models and some, some various art pieces. So I think I had probably three pieces of source code, like full, full, full applications that I could show off and then kind of a spattering of other stuff. Uh, you know, the thing is, again, since uh, if, if you have um, any experience in, like if you've messed around with Unity at all, have you tried that? Um, well, me and my roommate, we just bought a game design studio type thing. We all chipped in. I'm doing some sound design for his game that is uh, kind of like a spin on asteroids, like with a twist. Uh, also, Space War, because we learned about that in class. So I'm doing a lot of the sound design for that with uh, inspiration from Vaporwave, actually, and retro music. Um, and so I've been, I, I put together a few pieces for that in about a week or two. And I have a little bit of art, but I'm not a good artist either. <laughs> So, uh, oh, again, if you're if you're not showcasing art, so don't worry about that. I was just gonna say, just make sure that you can even take a lot of games and show like, hey, different tuning to this same game plays out like this, and I, and here's what I've done to show that. Like, I understand how this works. Um, one thing about portfolios, and I know that is like, you don't want to make it that super big menu that they have to like read through and don't know what they want to see. So um, there's this idea of, and this is, I don't remember where I got it from, but it's just this idea of lenticular game design, right? Where you can put something out there in front of the game player and they'll understand it right away. But as they play it more and play it more, they'll realize that they can do more with it than they actually saw, right? So your portfolio should be that. Your portfolio should be really easy to engage the person. And if they decide to keep going, then they can play the game. Then they can like go into your source code, right? Definitely put what's most important and what's about you at the front. But you have to like draw that person in and not scare them away with like, here's a big box of stuff that you can like start looking through. Yeah, you got to bower burr that stuff. Make that pretty house. Yeah. All right. yeah. So in regards to what you guys were saying earlier about, you know, all of us are graduating with the same thing, right? Our degrees and that you really have to step up and show that you can go beyond. Speaking in your experience, what do you think, like something specific to Santa Cruz that you did here, maybe, you know, extracurriculars or even a specific class or talking to someone or like what specific things that you guys did on this campus helps you, you know, get that extra leg up uh, above someone or something like that? Hmm. Specific things. <laughs> or just, yeah. you know, whatever you have to say. Well, for me, I don't know if it's specific to Santa Cruz was, but being able to explore, right? I mean, I came to this college and I was able to go, I think I got accepted to Berkeley, Davis, um, UC Santa Cruz, and some college out in Texas that I never visited. Um, but Santa Cruz was the last college that I visited, right? And when I l came to Santa Cruz, I was like, oh my God, it's in a forest. Like, done. <laughs> you know, I, I, I have reoccurring dreams of being a forest child in Neverland going to UC Santa Cruz. But, you know, living in this forest, there's five different ways to get anywhere, right? I can go down, I forgot what the name of that main road is. I can go up above campus. I can go below campus, right? I came here, what, like, when, when did we come here? Like, four weeks ago? We came, we came here together to check it, out, check it all out. And I was walking around, and I went under this tunnel I had never seen before that, when I stomped, made this amazing chirping sound. And it was so cool. So one specific thing that 
Santa Cruz did embody and have me get it was exploration, right? I had friends at Porter that were art students, and I learned a lot from them. I had friends, you know, at Merrill who were very into activist activism, right? I met uh, my first vegan here, you know, <laughs> like all these things got me like got me learning, and so I think the the like feeling of exploration and openness was a very important part of Santa Cruz, you know. I don't know about other colleges, but you can audit classes. I don't know if that's still true, but you can audit classes. Oh my God, I went to Simmer's Colloquia and learned about string theory. Like that was like amazing. I had no idea we had 11 dimensions. Like, <laughs> the, you know, how now Possibly. I know how math applies to, to physics. So just that exploration, that openness and the openness of people here. Again, I don't know how the same it is, but you know, the hippiness, the openness, the nature, like all that was really important to, again, how I got where I was and who I became. Uh, I think for me, it was more in terms of practical experience. So I ended up taking, I think a couple of the higher level CS courses, I forget which ones they were, but they had uh, final projects that were game related. And so the goal was to create a game, like a finished product. Um, and, uh, that gave me actually a lot of the experience that I needed to get my foot in the door at Santa Cruz games because I had kind of tinkered here and there with like really simple games before that, but I'd never kind of gone for it with an actual team and work with a set of people with different responsibilities and then work together to create a final product um, that was you know playable and fun to, fun to play. Um, so that I think was kind of the bridge that I needed to make the, the final decision as I was you know, realizing I was really interested in programming and I wanted to be a software engineer to knowing that I wanted to be a game programmer, or a, you know, game software engineer. Um, so you know, using those types of classes as a resource I think is good. Uh, joining any sort of like external organizations, like I think they have a couple, um, I think ACM, a chapter here or something like that that you can join. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So stuff like that that uh, kind of gets you a, a basic community that you already have connections with. So you know, coming out into the workforce, you you already have people that you can talk to and uh, interact with and get referrals from. Uh, just making use use of any sort of those types of resources, I think, is valuable. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm. Uh, this will be my last quarter. I'm a master's student in computer science. Um, and you've mentioned a bunch of stuff that I could be doing, but I'm, I'm really at the end of the line here. So I'm like, what I've done, like pretty much what I have is what I've done. And I don't really have time to do really anything else except, you know, finish my last class and wrap up my master's project. and. I haven't applied for any jobs yet, so I'm sort of forcing myself to start thinking about it. But I'm, I'm wondering how best to proceed, um, given where I'm at. And um, yeah, I'm really trying to find either an internship or a job this by this summer, because um, I don't have a lot in savings. So I don't. So I have a pretty tight window of opportunity here. Um, are there places that you'd like to work? Um, like companies or just look? Yeah, companies or is, is it, I mean, what have you, what kind of a job would you envision? I mean, what, what would you like to do ideally, let's say? Um, yeah, I mean, I came here because I wanted, I was interested in wanted, wanting to do game development. Um, and I'm, I'm still interested in that. Um, I am a little worried about crunch time because I have health issues, so I really can't work, you know, 16, 12 hour days. Um, and, um, and I, I've done some, um, like I've made, you know, little small games by myself, like in unity, um, using a t tutorial, but like, um, wasn't part of a tutorial, but I like ported this, um, VR basketball game to gear VR. Um, and so I had to, you know, do some importing and write a little bit of code and whatnot. Um, 
so I'm still interested in that, but um, you know, I could also see myself doing other areas of software engineering, and um, I'd, I'd like either to stay in the Bay Area or move back to Austin, where I did my undergrad. So, good news. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, the Bay Area and Austin are pretty much like the big hubs. Um, secondly, uh, you've built some stuff, <laughs> so you have something to show. Uh, VR is exploding right now. There's tons of VR companies, uh, so many so that um, there's tons of VR startups. That, And the thing about startups is that they don't um, get the best engineers, and they have to actually, they're in the same situation that you guys are in, right? When you're a startup, I'm like, they're going to go to you and be like, hey, um, I can't pay you as much as everybody else, but I got this really cool idea. And you're like, well, Equity. I'm not as good as everybody else, but, you know, I'm going to, I do know how to do engineering. So... I don't think it's as bleak as you think it is. It's, there's a lot of opportunity out there. And the other thing is there's a lot of people that will pay you for things um, in general, right? They will, they will literally, there's somebody that needs your skills, especially as an engineer today. It's just about finding them. And um, that might actually give you a little bit more runway. You know, you don't want to trap yourself into that hey, I'm doing jobs making Flash websites for five years. Like, no, don't do that. But if doing a Flash website for somebody for the next month will get you another summer, do it. It'll, it'll get you there. But again, just go to the peninsula, type in VR into um, VR events into Google. Maybe it's, they're kind of weird because they do them near you, so you might have to drive up to, you know, Palo Alto and say, events near me, VR, and then you'll get a list of events. But they're all over the place, like, and you'll find startups, you'll find people that want to effectively give you a chance. Yeah, and there's no reason to assume that you should necessarily just be doing an internship. I mean, if you have experience, then apply for, you know, either an entry level or whatever you feel like you could manage. There. So have some confidence in that. Yeah, done this before. if you kind of want to leave your options open, I would suggest starting to look at one of the more established companies like Microsoft. Uh, you know, you could, you could get a job as a junior engineer there probably fairly easily. I mean, I don't know exactly what your skill set is, but you want to go with a safe bet, you know, get an entry level position and then build your skill set from there. And then if you, you want to pursue games, use that as an opportunity to grow yourself while in your, in your spare time working on games on the side. Uh, posting it to GitHub or your portfolio or wherever it is, and then kind of just have that buffer there where you know you're, you get income, you're growing your skills, but at the same time you're you're furthering yourself into what your career actually what you, what you want your career to actually be, uh, and it just happens to be in in the same sphere as what you're already doing, so you already have kind of a leg up there. Yeah, that's along the lines of what I, I what seems most realistic for me at this point. So. Yeah, Microsoft or any other company like that is probably pretty stable. I wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't worry too much. And then once you have, uh, also, once you, the, the benefit of that is that usually that's a decent portfolio piece thing too down the line for you. You decide, you know, Microsoft's not what you want to be doing for your whole life. You can apply it to a startup at that point. You know, that's doing exactly what you want to do once you've decided. <clears throat> uh, remember how you, uh, you guys were just talking about uh, startups like a good couple of seconds ago? Um, and how you said, you know, you, we may not be able to pay you this much right now, but, you know, we'll just uh, compensate you like less than everyone else, I guess. Um, uh, in the beginning when you were working at, um, what was it called, Machine Zone? Um, for the startup and everything, how was that in general, like with your experience? With that in the beginning with, this, with, with it being a startup where there was only like four people? And yeah. how was just that in general? Are you, are you talking about uh, in terms of the, the, the monetary aspect of it or just um, what just was the experience, experience like? Um, it was very, very different than a, a traditional company. Um, very flexible, but at the same time unorganized. So there was really no structure to it. Uh, the three founders, one was an engineer, the CTO. Uh, we had the CEO who was kind of the designer, um, slash public face of the company. And then we had an art director. 
uh, and then myself as kind of a backup engineer who was trying to learn the system and start developing for it. Um, so they had already created, uh, I think, one or two games before I joined. Um, a very simple, like, text-based RPG game uh, on iOS. And they had wrote, written all the client code, all the server code. And I think they had hired some contractors before they brought me on to help them finish that. And so they were, they, my first uh, task as coming on board was to convert all the server code to be non-client authoritative because basically the game was saying, uh, oh, I just made this much money, uh, give it to me. And the server would say, okay, and, and give it to them. So it's, people could just hack it super easily. So my first job was make it server authoritative so nobody could hack it anymore. Um, and so that led me to learn the server side of it and then eventually I learned the client side of it. Um, but I was really kind of jumping around, uh, doing random tasks, putting out fires when things would break, I'd have to learn that system. Um, and that's, that's really what ended up causing kind of the 16 hour days all the time, uh, that sort of frantic work environment is there's no plan, there's no organization. It's just everything is happening out of reaction to something else because uh, we don't have customer support, we don't have an HR department, uh, we don't have anything that usually runs a company and structures a company. And so we're just talking amongst ourselves all day, oh crap, this is breaking, oh crap, this is breaking. Oh no, the users are complaining about this, we need to fix it. And so priorities shift all the time, and it's just, it's like a tornado, and you just, things are just flying around all over the place, and you're just trying to grab the most important thing at any given moment. And it goes on like that for a while. Um, and that can be super exciting, but it can also be really frustrating and stressful, and uh, you, you know, eventually you're drained after dealing with that for a long time. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the best I can describe it. Definitely, thank you. Hey, um, did you guys do any like summer internships when you were in college, and how do you feel about the importance of those? I did. Um, it was not related to engineering. So I did one uh, downtown San Jose for a consulting firm. I think they were, they were a legal consulting firm. And it was, it was really kind of just odd jobs, um, nothing really to do with software engineering, uh, a little bit of IT maybe, but mostly filing stuff, organizing, <coughs> excuse me, organizing stuff. <coughs> um, just, you know, it even involved getting people coffee sometimes. It was like the, the traditional intern style job. Um, but at the same time, I got to talk to people that work there and gather information and find out what it's like to work somewhere like that. You know, it, it wasn't what I wanted to pursue. But it gave me you know, at least some soft skills and some, some transferable skills that I needed and would find useful later on. Uh, so I would say it's definitely, it's definitely valuable. It's definitely important. Um, uh, if, you, if you think you have a better shot at just getting entry-level position somewhere out of college, I would go for that. Uh, but if you aren't that confident and don't want to take the risk, uh, of potentially not getting anything and just being hung out for a little bit, I would try for an internship. And there's plenty of them around here that you can check out if you, uh, there should be some resource on campus. And unfortunately, I don't know of it. But I'm sure if you search around, there's re resources for internships or something you can look at for, for Silicon Valley. Yeah, th uh, I, th I think, um what was the the career center? I mean, they might have something, but, but actually, so personally, I I didn't the in, the stuff that I did again. It was I ended up doing music after finishing physics here, so it was kind of very different. But um, people, uh, other people that I've worked with and I've talked with over the years, I think one thing that I've come across is there was a, a friend of mine who basically again sent out like 80, 80 resumes, like for every single company. He got maybe you know heard back from 10 and only got interviews with three and the thing that he actually set up with that company was he said you know I'll work for intern wages for like a couple of months and you know if you're happy with what I'm doing then let's talk about like a, a, a change at that point maybe to entry level or whatever it is right so there's certainly I mean, that might be something to consider is like if you certainly feel like you're somewhere in the middle you know there's no reason not to offer something like that uh, these things are very negotiable, so, you know. Uh, one thing about internships is they range, right? So you do go for the internships, but make sure you know what you're getting out of the internship for yourself. You know, I've seen internships which were 
I would say terrible and they just take advantage of somebody and don't give them anything in compensation or recommendations or anything like that. And I've seen the opposite, which was a very structured internship, which paid very well and was very defined and had like end dates and things like that. You really do want those more structured ones because they know what you're doing and they're there to teach you and they want to drive you and bring you into the company. Um, but also don't shy away from the other less structured internships. Just make sure that everybody agrees to what you're doing and how long you're doing it for and what you're getting, right? That way it's not a surprise and somebody just uses you as free labor. And most of the time, if you are do have a skill and you are giving them the skill like engineering, probably shouldn't be free for too long. Maybe not free for it at all. Um, but yeah, just uh, I would recommend them. Just be careful and you know talk everything th through and make sure that the guidelines are set and the expectations are set. Yeah, and research industry rates uh, just by the different. That's so, so you know what you're what, what to expect. Um, yeah, so if I, so I'll, I'll be graduating with a master's degree, but I have no professional work experience, like, you know, and they're asking for some level, so many years of experience, like how should I, um, do I have zero experience or, you know, all the years I've been in college, like what's, well, how do I figure that out? So this is always a funny question and a funny thing to see on job descriptions. Um, and you always have to put it there. But um, what does it mean to have experience, right? To have experience means that you've been through enough things that you're going to be able to foresee problems and be able to make good plans, right? Um, and that's really what people want. You know, I've seen very, very intelligent people with no experience come in and mess something up because they don't know to use source control or they don't know that you can bring a server down by doing select star on a super, you know, we like, we have databases with billions of rows and maybe your database on your computer has 400 rows and you can select star, okay. Or maybe it has a thousand row, rows or a hundred thousand rows, but you select star on a you know billion of rows server, you're gonna bring that thing down. So that's what experience gets you, right? And that's really what you're looking for. So yes, you might not have the professional experience, don't let that dissuade you, still apply. Maybe it'll bounce your resume. Maybe the computer will not let it go through. Um, I wouldn't put that your experience in at UCSC or you know working with your friends is professional experience, but I would definitely put that it's there, right? Because the experience question is just there to make sure that people know that you had to have done it before, and we're not going to take someone who has just read the book, right? Um, you know you. I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen Karate Kid, but there's literally that scene where he's looking at the book and he's like, you don't learn karate from the book, right? You don't learn anything from the book. You actually have to do it. Like, yes, you're, you can go to a lecture, you can absorb the information, you can do the homework, right? But when you're actually in it, you actually learn the details. Uh, something that I remember about um, doing electronic music, like I learned so much about writing but I didn't realize how important compression was until I got into the into um, you know doing things professionally. Like compression was extremely important. That was something that I needed experience for because I needed to know that there was a million different speakers that sucked, and I wasn't going to be on good speakers all the time, right? And so those are the things that come with experience. So don't lie about your experience, but definitely point out your experiences. I guess is what I would say. I think also going back to connections, uh, it also becomes really important here because, yeah, no experience is gonna kind of keep you towards the bottom of the candidate pile. Um, the easiest way to short circuit that is to know somebody on the inside. Uh, and if it's somewhere that you wanna work, that's even better. Um, because they're the one that's gonna get your resume in front of somebody, they're the one that's gonna give put in a good word for you. And I mean, 
honestly, it, it's, it is the most important thing when we say that, you know, it's important. It is the most important thing to know people. And that's always going to get you better opportunities than if you just go in cold. Um, so reach out to people again, go to mixers events, uh, based on your interests or what you want to do. Just, you know, look up events in San Francisco, events in the Bay area. There's tons and tons out there and just try to meet people and you never know, like you could meet somebody, uh, the next event you go to and five years later they get you a job. Um, so just always make connections. You never know where it's going to lead you. It could, it could, you know, get you somewhere you never thought you'd get in the future. Uh, but you could meet someone tomorrow that already has a job open and, uh, you know, now, now here's another opportunity you didn't know existed. So just, you know, get out there. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>